You are listening to the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. This is Mind Pump. Now, today's episode uh, is a fun one. Um, I got to interview Bishop Robert Barron. He's a Catholic bishop. He's been on the show a couple times before, and he always uh, does such a great job. We always get our minds blown by some of the stuff that he talks about. But in today's episode, I got real specific with him. I wanted to know why we seem so divided over the past 10 years. Things have gotten more partisan, extreme. Um, I mean, for all intents and purposes, of course, up until the pandemic, it seemed like uh, the numbers look great. Uh, people were making more money. The average person had more wealth. Uh, race relations, although people perceived them to be worse, uh, statistically, they looked a lot better. Um, we seem to be in better position, yet everybody seems to be upset, and perhaps the answer cannot be found in wealth or in government action, but rather somewhere else. So I talked to Robert Barron, Bishop Barron, about this, um, and I thought, you know, maybe he has the answer. Maybe it's a, something to do with our spiritual side. Maybe it's character flaws in humanity right now. Maybe this is something that was predicted. And also, how can we fix this? Uh, he's an incredibly, incredibly intelligent man, I amazing communicator. Um, he has uh, he uses media, new media, in ways that um, I don't think anybody else from the Catholic Church has ever done before. He's got a phenomenal podcast uh, called The Word on Fire Show. Um, and his YouTube channel is how I found him. In fact, uh, Bishop Robert Barron, you can find him on YouTube. And he answers pretty much any question that people ask him, everything. He's always reaching out to new people uh, to talk to them about whatever they want to talk about. Um, I think you're going to love this guy, whether you are religious, Christian, or not. Um, in fact, some of the people that liked his previous episodes the most were atheists. So I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Now, before it starts, um, I want to let everybody know that we're at the final hours for our January special. Um, we had what's called the Starter Bundle, which combined multiple workout programs designed for people who are getting started with their fitness journey or people who took a long break and want to get back into fitness. So this program includes MAPS Starter. This is a two- to three-month workout program. It's perfect to get started with. Then we have MAPS Anabolic. That's the program you move into after Starter. That's great for building muscle and strength and shaping and sculpting the body and speeding up the metabolism. It's great for fat burning because of the, the metabolism-boosting effects. Uh, we also have MAPS Prime in there, which teaches you how to prime your body before your workouts to prevent injury, to get better connection, better form and technique and mobility. And then we also put the Intuitive Nutrition Guide in there to help you with your diet. Now, if you got all of these at retail, uh, you'd spend over $340, but right now you can get all of them for 80 bucks. So 80 bucks uh, in the starter bundle gives you all those programs, lifetime access, plus a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're finding this episode, when we drop it, you have a few hours left to take advantage of this promotion. Go check it out. Go to mapsjanuary.com. That's the word maps, M-A-P-S, january.com. Bishop Barron, thank you so much uh, for taking the time for me to be able to talk to you about certain things that are happening right now. Um, for me personally, it's a bit confusing to see just kind of the, the way things are going. And the reason why it's confusing to me is because um, by all objective measures, uh, at least uh, material measures, um, things have been uh, phenomenal, uh, or at least we've been doing phenomenal objectively. Again, materially speaking, uh, before the pandemic, um, you know, we had uh, wealth was uh, doing great, real wages were growing, unemployment was very low. This was just a, just a trend that had been happening for uh, for decades. Crime was at all time lows as well. Uh, yet um, polls were showing that Americans were more divided than ever. Depression seemed to be on the rise. Anxiety on the rise. Lots of mental health metrics seemed to be getting worse, especially among uh, the youth. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people talk about um, the answers being found maybe in m more wealth, uh, you know, uh, more material uh, stuff. And it just doesn't seem to match up with what's happening. And of course, we had this pandemic and things seem to be um, worse than ever. Uh, so that's why I wanted to talk to you. You're, you're somebody I turn to uh, for answers when um, uh, I, I don't can't find answers in other places. So I'd, I'd like to ask you, what you what is going on? Why are things? Why do people seem to be 
feeling so bad? Why do we feel so divided when, objectively speaking, again, uh, we seem to be doing great in, in lots of areas? Yeah, good. So thanks for having me on, first of all. Um, you know, you raise a lot of interesting issues there. Uh, here's a first reaction. I'll speak now out of the spiritual tradition. Even if all things are going well, and, and the things that we can measure, like employment, like income, you know, uh, that sort of thing, uh, there's more to life than that. And so it doesn't surprise me really at all if depression could be on the rise, even as these material benefits are on the rise, because people need more than that. And uh, what's also on the rise, you and I have talked about this a lot, is secularism. What's on the rise is a bracketing of religion. And I can guarantee you that will lead people down a road to depression. No matter how uh, prosperous we are materially, if we're not prospering spiritually, we're going to walk down the road toward depression. So that doesn't really surprise me. We got to be attentive to um, a greater matrix than just the economic and the political. Second observation is, you know, let's face it, this past year, the race issue again presented itself as a real um, danger in our society. What I mean there is from the beginning, there's been this problem of racial injustice. I mean, uh, without going so far as to say it's the original sin of America, I mean, from the beginning, with slavery and coming up even after slavery has ended uh, in, in decades and decades of, of oppression, the civil rights movement, which was a huge step forward, but then that too followed by a, a sort of stubbornly enduring, um, you know, racial oppression. So I, I don't deny that for a minute. And the George Floyd incident and others um, brought that to the fore. I mean, it brought it again to people's consciousness. And there was legitimate anger about that. Um, now, it's never right to express your anger in um, violence, but I understand where some of the frustration societally is coming from. Now, maybe we can talk more about this as we go, but I mean, I'm not at all excited about the sort of woke ideology that has come to dominate this discussion, but that there's a problem, I don't deny for a minute, and, and that there are these tensions that are really, they're moral problems. So again, to go back to your opening observation, even if we're flourishing at the material level, which we are in many ways, still, if there are moral and spiritual deficits in a society, that's going to lead to all sorts of, uh, of psychological and spiritual problems. Um, you, you said secularism has is, is grown um, and has exploded. What do those numbers look like? Uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about, um, in our country right now, about 26% would claim no religion. And to give you a sense of um, a proportion there, when I was a kid, so like in the early 70s, it was about 3% of our country would have claimed no religion. Among younger people, say 30 and younger, it rises to 40%. So it bodes very ill for the future that 40% of our young people would now claim no religion at all. And see, I think that's a recipe for um, deep suffering. Because when you bracket that part of life, that dimension of life, Something very deep in us is not going to be satisfied. So those are a couple of, of the um, statistics around secularism. Okay, so you also mentioned morality. Um, yeah. Can we find uh, objective morality uh, without religion? Well, yeah. I mean, so a non-religious person could still intuit that there are objective moral values. I mean, so I think a, an atheist of goodwill should be able to see that rape or murder— uh, that that oppression of people because of their of their race, et cetera, et cetera, are all intrinsically wrong things to do. They're all objectively wrong. Now, I would argue what a non-believer can't do is finally justify that because the question naturally arises, where do these objective moral values come from? They're, they're a bit like the objective intelligibilities that the sciences depend upon, right? Every, every science goes out to meet some form of objective intelligibility in the world. So naturally, a question arises, where does that come from? Why should the world be marked in every nook and cranny by intelligibility? So in a similar way, why are there these moral values and disvalues? Where do they come from? And I would argue the only way, finally, to ground that intuition is by talking about God, namely a moral law giver, 
you know. But to your question, sure, a, a non-believer can recognize objective moral values. Mm. You know, from my perspective, I think sometimes just as I've gotten older, I've, I've read more about history and I, I realized how much I took for granted um, you know, widespread belief in what you what we may call objective morality. It, it did it, it was it didn't seem so natural when you go back just a hundred years. In fact, uh, you know, believing that people should be treated uh, equally is a relatively new concept. If you look at uh, how we've lived for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, using that as an example, it, it seems like the natural state of of man is not, uh, you know, kind of the morals that we may now believe to be objective. Am I am I shooting in the well, dark here? I'd make a distinction between objective moral values and our subjective capacity to appropriate them and recognize them. I think there can be real evolution and real development in our capacity to see them. Hmm. Uh, let's say the fundamental equality of all people, which is grounded as Jefferson himself saw in God, right? All men are created equal because we're not equal, you know, in almost any other area. We're not equal in intelligence or courage or beauty or skill, or we're not equal physically. We're not equal at all. But I'd say what Jefferson correctly intuited is we're all created equal. We're all equally children of God. So that's an objective truth. That has always been true, but it took let's say in our case, the Western mind, a while to fully appropriate that. And then I would say fully to pull out the implications of it for the way we organize ourselves politically. Uh, so I would say Jefferson and company weren't so much inventing a new set of ideals. They were more clearly appreciating and then appropriating objective moral values. I see. How is this different than the uh, the philosophies of, say, Karl Marx, where uh, you, you know we're talking now about people being created equal, um, whereas Marx's philosophy is m- uh, more about us being equal um, and and trying to achieve being equal in, in all, I guess, ways. How is that? How are those two different? Well, Marx is coming out of an entirely different philosophical framework. Um, Marx's philosophy of the human person is that we we really make ourselves who we are. So there is no objective human nature for Marx. One of his famous lines is, a human nature is the sum total of social relations. So it's the way a society organizes itself economically determines sort of who we are. So there's there's the human being in a, in a slave economy, human being in a feudalistic economy, human being in an early capitalist economy. And then Marx envisioned human being in perfect communism. And they would all be different instantiations of human nature because there's nothing objective about it. Um, that does have implications for the way Marx understands the moral life, which is why a lot of Marxists following him will say things like, hey, whatever you need to do to bring about the revolution, to bring about communism, okay. Because there, there really is no objective moral uh, value. There's a human nature being created as we go. So Marx is coming out of an entirely different philosophical framework, and I would say, finally, a dangerous one. You you mentioned this uh, kind of woke movement, and some of the characteristics of it, from my uh, you know perspective, uh, seem to view things or uh, people as either being oppressed or oppressors. So you're right. the, you're in one category or the other category. Right. Is does this does this kind of current woke movement, which is uh, quite different in my, for, from my perspective, again, for, from classic, classical liberalism or what right. you know, liberals might have been in the 1960s, um, does this have its roots in, in Marxism? Yeah, and other thinkers too, but Marx is one of them. I, I've identified Marx, Nietzsche, Sartre, and Michel Foucault as some of the major players in the formation of the woke mentality. And I think you're absolutely right the way you put it there is – the tendency to see human beings through this one lens, the lens of power. So who has it, who doesn't have it? The lens of the oppressor and the oppressed. Put it in Hegel's terms, and Marx was deeply Hegelian, the master-slave dynamic. Who's the master, who's the slave? Now, is there something to that? I would say, sure, that's that's one way we might look at human society. But there tends to be a reduction in, in the woke movement to that, you know? And also the questioning of an objective human nature that draws us together. What I much prefer, as you say correctly, in classical liberalism is that. 
the appeal to our common humanity, an appeal to common moral values, and a common human nature that brings us together. And on that basis, we can move toward greater and greater justice. Now, that's the language of Martin Luther King, and I'm a great advocate of King's. What we're dealing with today is something very different. It's it's a different philosophical framework, and I think a much um, worse one. Yeah, you you bring up Martin Luther King. I'm glad you did because um, you know as I'm looking at everything that's kind of happening, uh, there seems to be some similarities to the turmoil of the 1960s and 70s. Um, you know, we had civil rights leaders assassinated. We had a president uh, who was assassinated, his brother. Um, a, a war that was very unpopular. People forced uh, into a draft. Uh, protests that were. Absolutely insane. Um, Double-digit inflation in the 1970s. Uh, oil yeah. embargo. I mean, it was the the peak of domestic terrorism, I believe. Uh, and, and you know, example being like the Weather Underground, who actually bombed uh, a federal building, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, so similar in the turmoil, but it seems very different. What are the differences between now, what's happening now, and in the 1960s and 70s? Yeah, as you rehearse all that, Sal, I was thinking, I lived through all that. I was a kid. You know, when King was killed in 1968, I was eight years old. But I remember vividly his assassination, Robert Kennedy's, in also 68. I remember all the things you've been describing throughout the 1970s. Yeah, in terms of the turmoil and kind of social upheaval, but I'd say here's the major difference. The civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s was led almost exclusively by deeply religious people, mm -hmm. King being the most famous. I mean, he's a Christian minister, but the top leadership in that movement was largely religious people. And they brought together, I think, very cleverly and very effectively, the ideals of the Bible. So think here of King invoking Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos and Hosea. He invokes the great a prophetic tradition of Israel, right, that speaks out on behalf of the poor and behalf of the oppressed. They, they link that together with the great American tradition, which is grounded in what you call correctly classical liberalism. So when King stands on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963, and he invokes the Hebrew prophets, and he also invokes, you know, Jefferson and the Declaration and Abraham Lincoln to bring the American vision I like that. I thought that was tremendous how he brought those two traditions together. I don't see either one of those in the woke movement today, and that's what bugs me about it. Now, before I say any more about that, I'll say something very positive about it. The deep concern for people who are oppressed, the deep concern to uh, right wrongs, to address injustice, I'm all for it. That's right out of the Bible. Uh, the Bible gave to Western culture, especially, but, but to the whole world, but it gave to Western culture this deep sense of identification with the poor and the oppressed and reaching its culmination in this crucified criminal dying on an instrument of torture outside of Jerusalem. So the fact that the crucified Jesus is at the heart of our Western civilization, that's where our concern for the victim comes from. So to that, I say, hooray. I say, terrific. The problem is the woke people. Notice, first of all, the lack of religious leadership. The, the movement today is not led by religious people because there's often a hostility between the woke philosophy and religion. That, to me, is a tragedy. Uh, I'd be so much happier if we could find that space again that Martin Luther King found, where classical liberalism meets the Bible in a societal a transformation. So I, that's what, why I prefer that 50s, 60s style to what we have now. Yeah, it seems like um, the movement today is not just not working with, um, you know, religious leaders, but rather might even be opposed. Um, right. I know d during this period of time, we've, se we've seen churches get vandalized. I know um, here in California, um, there were some statues that were torn down, Unipro Serra, uh, in fact, uh, why, why, why is this happening? Why is the, the church and why are religious institutions being uh, attacked at the moment? I'll give you one reason. I mentioned those four figures, from Marx, Nietzsche, Sartre, Foucault. They have many things in common, but one thing they really have in common is they all hated religion. They were all anti-religious. Um, religion tends to be seen in the woke um, perspective as part of the power establishment. 
as part of the uh, oppressor class. And religion is a holdover from a more superstitious time, religion in league with uh, powerful and oppressive forces. Uh, King did not see it that way. I mean, King comes up out of the the wonderful kind of a church tradition of the American South. But the woke uh, folks are influenced by deeply anti-religious people. And so it manifests itself in some of this hostility toward religion. I was involved in some of that stuff this past summer because in my pastoral region, so I, I'm in Santa Barbara County and Ventura County in California, uh, there were groups going after the Junipero Serra statues in Ventura, which was on civil, it was on you know state owned property. But they also were going after a statue on our own property at the Santa Inez Mission. So in both places, I stood with the people that were were trying to defend these statues because I thought that protest was such an irrational, you know, deeply unfair characterization of Junipero Serra, who was in fact a great friend of and advocate for the uh, the first peoples here. So anyway, it's part though, as you say correctly, of this anti-religious quality. And that's what I hate. I wish we could find the space that King found in the 60s. I'd be happy from the religious standpoint to to have a conversation with people today who are concerned about social justice, quite rightly, but are doing it in a way that I think is less than productive. Yeah, you you mentioned um, the, some of the philosophers that may be behind the the, the current, I guess, uh, woke movement, um, and, and some of their what they may have in common. One, uh, you know, kind of moving laterally, if when I look historically at tyrants, um, you know, uh, people who've ruled with an iron fist, um, dictatorships, more often than not, they tend to be opposed to religion or at least religious freedom. Why? Because we're the um, dissenting voice. If you're claiming totalizing control over the society, and that's what, you know, whether it's, it's Hitler, it's Stalin, it's Mao, it's Pol Pot, it's Castro, uh, all those folks were trying to exercise a totalizing control over the society. And religion stands athwart that because we think that is a usurpation of, of power that's completely illegitimate. Um, in speaking for God, too, we speak for a moral norm that stands outside the will to power. So if someone assumes power, they want a totalizing control over society, and there's no check on them, right? Well, what stands athwart that is religion, because religion says, no, no, we, uh, you, you can't control the whole of society, and you are, as we say, under God, mm. right? Your authority is not something you invent and have have no limit. You're you're under God. And see, religion speaks those truths, which is why you're quite right. The tyrants of the 20th century to a person opposed religion and saw religion as the problem. Um, And that goes back to the French Revolution. I mean, what really uh, gives rise to modernity is that great event at the end of the 18th century. And what was characteristic of it, but a deep hostility to the church. And you'll see that rising up whenever this kind of Jacobin uh, mentality arises. And I think the woke people, it's a Jacobin movement today mm. that has always been anti-religious. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is when you um, you know look at old photos of uh, communist buildings or Nazi, you know, uh, offices or yeah. even, you know, today, North Korea or China, you see pictures of the world leaders in people's homes, uh, you see them, you know, statues of them, uh, almost as if they need to be worshipped. Um, uh, and if and you can't worship anyone above them, I think that's kind of pointing to what you're saying. Yeah. When people say, when they do those polls and they say, you know, are you religious? And they say, you know, no. Do you worship anything? And they say, no. Are they not aware that they're still worshiping something. Are, are we, yeah. is our very nature in that we worship something? Yes. And you actually articulated there a very deep truth. I would say from a biblical perspective, we were made for praise. We were made to worship. That Read the opening verses of the book of Genesis, and that's what you find is this great liturgical procession of the creatures coming forth from God And I say that as a Catholic, we recognize in that high poetry of Genesis, as the creatures come forth, it's like a procession. Well, who comes at the end of it but the human being? 
well, who comes at the end of a liturgical procession but the one who will lead it, right? So there we see, there's biblical anthropology, is the human being is meant to lead all of creation in a great chorus of praise to God. Now, what's sin? It's bad praise. It's always the same thing. It's bad praise. I begin worshiping someone or something other than the true God. And what follows from that is a disintegration of the self and of the society. Now, that, if you want, in a nutshell, that's the book of Genesis. That's the beginning of Genesis in a nutshell. And so you're quite right. When we stop worshiping God, we don't stop worshiping. We just worship something else. So worship just means worthship, right? What what do you give highest value to? Mm. Everyone's got something. You can say it's my own ego, it's my family, it's it's power, it's wealth, it's my it's the government, it's the culture, whatever. But everyone's worshiping something. The Bible keeps saying, forget these forms of false worship. Get order to correct worship. You know, so that's a very deep intuition you've got there, which is quite right. Um, everyone's religious in that sense. Everyone worships something. Uh, the key is worshiping the right thing. Yeah, um, years ago, one of the ways I found you was a, a video that you actually had put on YouTube um, talking about uh, about this subject, and you talked about power, pleasure, I think it oh, was yeah. money. Yeah, um, yeah wealth, uh, pleasure, power, honor. Honor, right. And, um, you know, I was an atheist, um, you know, years ago, and if you asked me if I had worshipped anything, I would have said, no, I don't worship anything. Um, yeah. But then when I understood them, I actually, actually reveal what I worship, the way I understood it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you know, obviously as humans, every choice we, we make is based off of value. So like, for example, yep. I chose to wear this shirt today because I thought it was be- better to wear this shirt than another shirt. And I chose, I choose to do this job because it's better than an, another choice. And if I, what I eat for lunch and uh, along those lines, everything I choose is something that I value more than the other right. choices. And ultimately at the top of that is my my top value, which right. is what I worship. So in other words, my actions revealed what I worshiped. What's the problem with that versus worshiping God? Why worship God versus allowing myself to just allow my actions to determine something else is valuable or most valuable to me? Because God is the highest value. And so when you when you forget that and you turn something which is less than God into God, it causes turmoil within you. Um, you know, when Augustine says, my heart is restless until it rests in thee, O Lord. Like you made you made me for yourself, and therefore my heart is restless. It means even as you achieve these various goods, and everything you describe, you're right. These are values. My talking to you right now is something I chose to do because it's a value. Now, ask the question why about five times, and you'll come to the religious level. Mm. What I mean is, okay, so you chose to be with Sal this morning. Well, Why? Well, because I think he has a good show and he has a large audience and we talk about some important things. Okay, well, why is that important to you? Well, because, you know, my job is to is to evangelize and to try to get the church's point of view out to as many as I can. Okay, how come that's important to you? Well, because, you know, Jesus commanded us to evangelize to the ends of the earth. Well, how come that's important to you? Well, I think Jesus is the son of God and what he says goes. You know I mean? And take anything you decide from getting out of bed in the morning Take the most trivial choice you make. Ask the why question five or six times. You'll get to ultimate value. Now, if you say, well, guess my ultimate value is I, I want to be, you know, happy, uh, pleasure. That's, that's the ultimate value for me. Or it's because I want people to admire me. You know, honor is my ultimate value. Well, it's really important exercise to uncover that. Then I would say, well, if, if you're stuck at the level of pleasure or honor or power or something, you're, you're not in the right spiritual space. You know, your heart is going to be restless because it's not meant for something as trivial as that. It, it's what differentiates us from, from the other animals. You know, a dog has his, has his dinner and has enough water and has a place to sit down. The dog is blissfully happy. Dogs are much happier than we are. It's obvious, isn't it? You look at a typical dog, they're much happier than we are because they attain what they're meant to attain much more readily. The trouble is, see, we're we're built for so much more than oh yeah, I found enough you know food and drink, and I got a place to rest, and I got enough people around me to entertain me. I'm not all that's fine, but I'm not I'm not destined for that. I'm destined for so much more than that, and so my heart is restless until it finds what it's looking for. 
Mm. In in my space of fitness, uh, you find people who um, just through their actions worship uh, their bodies, right? They worship yeah. fitness, yeah. and that ends up turning into um, a bad relationship with food or food or eating disorders, uh, you know, yep. overtraining, um, terrible insecurities um, because yep. it just it, there's no end to it. Um, yeah, and, and and I I imagine it's that way with other things. Uh, you know, when you see a celebrity who's got money and power and pleasure yes. and they commit suicide or they're de- you know depressed and you wonder well, how they seem to have everything it's almost as if they're um trying to quench their thirst with uh seawater right and see you will as you quite correctly say you will inevitably become addicted when you get stuck at one of those low levels because for just that reason so let's say you attain the the physique you've always wanted it's like this is like perfect i just won the whatever the top prize i was going for you know well, then the next day, I'm going to say, yeah, okay, but now i got to make it better, and, and I've, I've got to try harder, and I've got to keep going after it. Or you're looking for pleasure, and you find pleasure, but the pleasure always wears off, and so now I need to get more of it. And because the heart is actually ordered to God, not to these lower things, I'll get stuck in an addictive pattern because I'll say, well, I— it's not enough. I, I'm not happy. I, I don't have what I want. I just need more and more and more of this lower good. And the answer is no, you don't need more of that. Rather, take that lower good, whether it's your own physique, it's pleasure, it's power, and now give that to God. So you say, I'm doing this ad maiorum de gloriam, as Ignatius said, right? To the greater glory of God. Now, now your bodybuilding, your uh, pleasure, your power, your political position, whatever it is, will take on real meaning. Now it'll be something that is very life-giving, not something addictive. Mm. But that that's, we're, I think, at the heart of the spiritual life in many ways with these themes. And you see it, if you're a pastoral person, all the time. It's the basic pattern of, of us sinners that we get addictive in our, in our uh, you know, strategies. Yeah, um, it's funny as you, as you're talking. You know, I'm a, 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 I have three children. I just had a baby um, uh, about almost about three months ago, um, and my 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 second youngest is 11. So 11 years later, I had another baby. Yeah, and um, you know, if I were you know valuing kind of those worldly things that you talk about, pleasure, money, honor, uh, I probably would never have had any kids because kids are expensive. Yeah, they're very stressful. Uh, that's for sure. I'm, it's not. Uh, I'm not having as much, uh, you know, per, you know, personal pleasure, fun stuff. It's you know, a lot of the stuff is de- dedicated to children. Um, is this is the connection of secularism to people wanting less children? For example, is that a connection? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, watch when cultures are very ordered to God; they tend to be uh, more fruitful. Why is it in the Bible that the covenants that God makes with us? are almost always sealed with the command, go forth, be fruitful and multiply, because life follows from that. See, it's it's the fruitfulness of the whole of your ordinary life becomes greater the more you give it to God. That's the paradox. If I surrender that to a higher good, they all become better. You know, they, they, they become more themselves. That's, I think maybe you and I talked about this, but the image of the burning bush from the book of Exodus, that's what's being conveyed there spiritually, is the bush is on fire but not consumed. So the closer God gets to us, the more beautiful we become and, and the more radiant, and, and we give warmth and light to others, right? Yeah. But we're not consumed. It's not like God burns us up. No, he, he makes us more beautiful the closer we get to him. So you're... you're bodybuilding or fitness or whatever it is you do will become better, higher, a vehicle of grace the more you give it to God. Mm. So from your perspective, um, a lot of what's happening um, was predictable, predictable because of the decline of uh, religion or spiritual um, spirituality or value or worship in God? I, I, I wouldn't underplay that for a minute. I think it is true that the more secularized a society becomes, the more dysfunctional. I, I agree with that. But I also wouldn't want to lose the fact that a very real concern about racial justice emerged this past summer. I, I don't deny that for a minute. And that people were legitimately expressing 
a deep concern about it. Now, the violence that came from it and all that, you know, obviously is is not a good thing. But I, I wouldn't want to overlook that as though it's all just a question of, you know, secularism. It was people with a real passion for justice. And as I said, that's Amos and Isaiah and Hosea and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Jesus and the whole teaching tradition of the church advocates concern for the poor and the oppressed. So I, I'm I'm not against that at all. I think that was a, a healthy expression. Okay. You know, um, it, one of my pastimes is I, I love learning about economics and politics. And when I look back through um, history, uh, I noticed that the the most powerful ways to manipulate people is through real kind of feel good or justified feeling. So you mentioned, um, you know, the root of wanting people to not be oppressed, of people noticing injustice and wanting it to be changed and different. Um, you know, we're talking now the spiritual realm. Is that a, a feeling that is often manipulated by, not by God, but by Satan, by evil forces? And are we what does that look like when um, you know evil forces are at battle with with good within us? Yeah, and that's good. It's a good question, a searching question, because I think you're you're right. You know, the Romans had that saying, "Corruptio optimi pessima." You know, the the corruption of the best is the worst. And so, what's really beautiful and good? Passion for justice, a concern for the oppressed, reaching out to those on the margins who have been overlooked. That's beautiful. That's a great thing. But when it goes bad, it can go very bad. And it can turn into violence. It can turn into this deep um, rupture between classes and, and races, et cetera. It turns into violence. And it turns into scapegoating. And uh, here I rely on, on the work of that great uh, philosopher, René Girard, who said that when tensions arise in any society, could be your family to a nation state, by a very deep instinct, we reach out for scapegoats. So we reach out for someone to blame. And then we can all come together in a kind of ersatz uh, piece that we all come together and say, yeah, that person's to blame or that group is to blame. And we find a kind of equilibrium in that, you know, a sort of satisfaction. But it's deeply dysfunctional because it leads only to greater division and violence. So the scapegoating instinct is so deep in us. And I think that was on full display throughout this past year, you know, the casting about for for um, uh, scapegoats, the, the searching for the victim and so on. So that's a, a dysfunctional um, feature of this. Mm. Uh, we also saw a lot of uh, kind of these this, this mob uh, mentality. Um, I know from a psychological standpoint, uh, if you, you look at the studies, humans behave very differently when they're caught up in the frenzy of the mob. We tend to do things that we would never do if we were alone, um, right. act in ways that that are not characteristic of how we would act uh, on our own. Do you think uh, social media has uh, kind of spread mob mentality or made it um, – a bit cancerous, you know, because now you're meeting with other groups and you're sharing these things and we're, we're getting scared together. And, it's, yeah. you know, normally we'd had to get together, but now we can use the internet. Yeah, my answer is emphatically yes to that. And I say it, Sal, as someone who uses social media. So my ministry depends a lot on social media. So I don't want to demonize it. I mean, I think a lot of good can be accomplished through it. But boy, that's the shadow side. You're right, is it facilitates precisely the formation of mobs. And mob is the right word for what Gerard is describing. So together we find a common victim, the scapegoat, and, and we form ourselves precisely as a mob. So not rational, not loving, but rather this irrational and violent conglomeration of people. But, but we all sense the thrill of it, don't we? And that can be you're, you're in a school cafeteria, and a bunch of your buddies are bad-mouthing somebody, right? And you start, you hear that, and you say, oh, I, I, I want to get into that conversation. Let, let me be part of that. And then you, you feel this kind of commonality, but it's not a healthy commonality. It's a mob mentality. Well, take the high school cafeteria and now just extrapolate from that to, to a nation state, to a society. And you're right facilitated by social media that allows these mobs to form very quickly. 
And look at, don't we even refer to it as a Twitter mob? And I, I think one of the ugliest developments in the last, what, 10 years would be that, that a mob can form like that, watch how people are scapegoated like just overnight. And let's face it, lives can be destroyed. Now, there's the whole cancel culture side of this thing. But cancel culture is part of the scapegoating mechanism, right? let us It's that guy. It's that article. It's that lady wrote that. She said, and now the mob forms. We, we get excited within that mob, but then irrationally and with deep uh, hatred, we destroy people. So that dynamic is god-awful, and it's been facilitated, you're right, I think, by social media. It's very powerful. I, I even um, can sometimes catch myself getting caught up in yeah. a, a a frenzy um, just through, again, through social media or from around everybody, you know, people that think in similar ways uh, to the way I may think, and then I find myself thinking in more extreme ways. What's the antidote to, you know, that kind of mob that psychological effect, because uh, you know, you use social media. I use social media. It's I think it's a part of life. I think there's great things uh, with it. I wouldn't be able to do what I do without it. Um, yeah, you've been able to evangelize in ways um, you know people haven't been able to do in the past. Uh, how do we check that? What's the antidote to the the negative side of of mob mentality? Well, first to be aware of it and to w- aware of its dynamics. And I, I love the fact that you admitted, and I admit it too, that we all get caught up in it. We're all sinners here, and. And we're all in danger of falling into the Girardian uh, trap of getting excited by this mob, th- this group that's formed. And I can be part of that. And, and I, yeah, they're the one to blame. So it's very enticing. First thing, be aware of it. Secondly, don't cooperate with it. You know, a story that Girard especially loved from the New Testament was um, the woman caught in adultery in the Gospel of John. Remember that story mm-hmm. when, you know, the Pharisees, bring this woman to Jesus. We've caught her in the very act of adultery. So they found their scapegoat. And around them, this angry mob is forming, right? They're taking stones in their hand because they, with the Mosaic law, you know, we can stone this lady to death. What does Jesus do? And and they come to him, hey, tell us, what do you think about this? They, They want him to sanction it. And instead, he just bends down and he writes on the ground. And famously, we don't know what he wrote. It's the only time he's ever described as writing something in the New Testament, but we don't know what it is. But I think what's important there is he doesn't cooperate with it. He just I, he's doodles on the ground. I'm not going to cooperate with it. And then he has the devastating one-liner, right? Let the one among you without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. So that's a beautiful way to uh, disempower the Girardian mob. Don't recognize it for what it is. Don't cooperate with it, and then turn its energy against itself. <laughs> Let the one among you who's without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. Um, so I, I think especially for Christians, it's very important for us to be aware of this dynamic. Um, how sad, I'll speak bluntly here, that way too often in the Catholic media space, you got people stirring up these Girardian mobs. You got people stirring up just this kind of scapegoating violence. And that's especially tragic when Christians do it because we're the ones who should most be able to see through it. Mm. Um, You know, listening to what you're saying, I I agree 100%, but I also um, acknowledge that 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 can be scary uh, to be the one person to uh, stand up to the mob or not go along with the mob, it's, it's you get afraid. Uh, is my business going to be destroyed? Um, am yep. I going to be hurt? What do you do in that situation? Uh, what do you do in that situation where um, you're afraid to not go along? Yeah, I get it. I get it. And people are very aggressive, and they're they're trying to destroy careers and destroy lives, you know. And so people start uh, getting naturally defensive. So I I get that. I wouldn't want to you know, be pontificating here to people that are really in danger of losing their their livelihood. But I think to do all we can to unmask and not cooperate with uh, these tendencies. Um, and yeah, to have the courage to tell the truth publicly when you know it's probably going to excite a Girardian mob. Um, no, I get it. And again, I don't want to sound facile, you know, to those whose lives and, and uh, 
work are, are really threatened by this. But the best we can do is is unmask it and try to um, disempower it. Yeah, I, uh, I think sometimes what gives me courage is realizing there's probably other people that may want to do the same. They just feel like they're alone. So maybe uh, make them feel like there's other people. Yeah. And, you know, there's, again, I, I want to be careful because I know I'm dealing with people's real lives here. But, um, you know, the, it's been said that the a lot of the woke um, cancel culture stuff is is propagated by essentially bullies and that bullies are are cowards. And we know that from the, you know, grade school playground. And so standing up to them can be the best thing and often disempowers them. And so Jesus in that story is basically standing up to a mob. He's he's challenging them. He's getting in their face. And um, now, you know, he paid the supreme price. <laughs> One way to read the cross is precisely Jesus himself becoming the scapegoated victim. Uh, so I get that. I get the seriousness of it. But to do all we can to stand up to the, to the bullies. Mm. I want to... Uh change directions a little bit and talk about the just the pandemic um, and the response that we've had to pandemic and, and uh, maybe what may happen in the future. Uh, let's start with the lockdowns um, or you know forced shutdowns of businesses that uh, most uh, governments enacted. Um, there's been a lot, I mean, on both sides, there's um, there are people, there are people saying it's necessary to save lives and there's people on the other side that say, uh, my life and my just my business is destroyed, and and this is a voluntary exchange. Um, are lockdowns moral? Is there a moral backing to them? Well, I'd say yes in general. If you want to speak abstractly about it, sure. And certainly in the beginning of this whole crisis, back in March and April and May, I think most of us saw, yeah, given the nature of this pandemic, there's something we should do to protect, you know, people's lives. And even now I'm here in Southern California where it's, it's, there's been a terrible spiking of this thing. So yeah, I understand that. And, you know, in the, certainly the opening months, the church was you know, very cooperative with the government and saying, yeah, we should keep our people safe. Now, is there legitimate room for a certain, you know, pushback or people saying, well, now, now, wait a minute, you know, we've done this, but, but do we have to do this for the next six months? And, I think there can be a healthy conversation within the body politic, you know, the, the people pushing back against the government. A good example is the church. You know, we, over these months, have, have been in kind of steady conversation with the government out here in California, pressing our case to allow greater openness in the churches. Uh, sometimes, I think, saying, okay, we understand, we acquiesce. Other times, pushing back, getting some of what we want. Other times, no. Okay, I think that's all right within a democratic polity that we have that kind of give and take. Um, so, in answer to your question, I'd say, yeah, lockdowns can be construed as something moral, but they're not absolute, and I think people can mm. can raise legitimate objections. There's there's also fears that that there may be um, policies to force uh, vaccinations to to you know just to be able to function in society. Is there a moral backing to to forcing people to vaccinate? Well, I suppose we have to look at what's on the ground. My instinct is against that. I think when the government starts imposing things on people, it tends to be a bad idea and tends to awaken resistance. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think what we are now, that most people are very open to receiving the vaccination when it becomes available. I think for the moment, we're probably okay with that. Uh, my instinct is against governmental impositions, but I suppose like in an extreme emergency, the government could legitimately do something like that. But we're getting a little bit too out of my field. Okay. I wouldn't want to be pontificating much further about that. Sure, no problem. Um, okay, so are you able to, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, we're, we, you know, we're kind of talking about maybe the root cause of this division among people uh, being uh, just lack of uh, a spiritual health. Um, where is this going? Where do you think this is going? What's it going to take to reverse it? Well, I do think ultimately it's a revival of uh, religion, a revival of the spiritual is what it will take to reverse uh, violence in our society. We can't solve this problem within a purely secular framework. If we, let's say the pandemic is over, we return simply to, you know, achieving as much material success as we can. I mean, that's fine, but it's not going to solve the societal issues. I mean, where does, where does racial hatred finally come from? I say a lack of a spiritual vision. 
uh, that we don't recognize objective moral values. We don't recognize our common humanity, which is grounded in our common um, uh, status as creatures of God. You know, uh, I, I think recovering all of that is key to a moral revolution. And if we just go back to uh, business as usual, we just go back to seeking the goods of the world, we're not going to solve these uh, fundamental problems. And let me say this too, Sal. I think it's very important. You know, I speak as a, as a Catholic bishop. Uh, we're never going to solve our problems this side of the end of time. You know, I mean, we're, we're a compromised, dysfunctional family. We're made up of sinners. There's no program, there's no political reform, there's no great leader that's ever going to solve our problems. And that's not to be pessimistic, it's to be deeply realistic. Um, we turn to the grace of God, finally. We, we beseech the grace of God. And there's no moral program or political reform that's ever going to solve our problems. Uh, you know, it, it's been said like maybe a week after uh, the eschaton, <laughs> meaning the end of time, we might actually solve our problems. You know, so it, there's a healthy Christian realism, I would say, about that. And a certain modesty in regard to whatever we propose. So, oh, I got it. I got, here's the solution. Here's what we need to do. Mm. I, I'm always wary of that. <laughs> Here's the program. Well, there's there's no program that's ever going to solve it because the problem is is a problem of sin, finally. When things get uh, really challenging, societally speaking, do we tend to see people become more religious or do we see people move away from religion? And, and then the second part to that is, how has this affected uh, the Catholic Church? Yeah, in answer to the first part of your question, I'd say yes tends to be the answer. And, and I'll, the reason for it is, Religion tends to flourish when people are brought to certain limits. See, as long as I'm living my life, I'm basically happy. I'm having my needs met and so on. Okay, I'm all right. But when I come up against limits, so I become sick, I fail, someone in my family dies, my business uh, collapses. At those moments when I'm more vulnerable and I feel the limits of my own finitude, I tend to look to what stands beyond the finite. I tend to look toward God, you know? So it's not like, oh, I just, there's religion as a crutch. No, I think it's a natural instinct that when we come up against the limits of our ordinary experience, we tend to look toward God. Um, you know, what's going to happen in the current situation? It's mm -hmm. too early to tell. We don't know. My biggest fear, to tell you the truth right now, is that people aren't going to come back to church because we have now for almost a year— and legitimately, we've we've suspended the obligation to come to Mass on Sunday, which is, you know, a very serious moral obligation. But we've suspended that because we've said, look, to keep yourselves safe. So people have gotten into the habit now, most people, of not going to Mass on Sunday. That concerns me a lot. And whether we can recover, um, I think we got we to gotta really work overtime to make sure that, that people don't stay away. Yeah, um, I you know I'll 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 have to say, Bishop. I think uh, people will come back because I I know for myself part of the value that I get going to church is being with other people, and I it, mm -hmm. I it hasn't been I haven't been able to replicate that. Yeah, with Zoom, <laughs> you know, even even this interview with you now uh, through Zoom, it's just it's just not the same. You don't get that same. Yeah. connection. So, um, I, no, I, I hope you're right. I sincerely hope you're right. Uh, that people feel just that way because, you know, as Catholics, I'll tell you one thing, this was about a few weeks ago. It was the governor of Virginia, I think. And he was talking about the shutdowns and he said, Hey, look, you don't need to come to church. You know, you can worship God anywhere and in, in your heart. Well, I did a little video on it because I said, no, no, uh, say what you want about that. But that's a very Protestant way to understand that, that worship is just an interior, personal, individual thing. Catholics feel very strongly about what you just said, that we come together, you know, we come together as the mystical body of Christ. And, and the fact that we, we worship together corporately matters immensely. And it's not like okay to say, oh, you're, you're fine, and you're, you go your way, and you go to the woods and worship, and you go to the beach. And No, no, we, Catholics don't believe that. We, we believe it's very important to come together in a sacred place, you know, where Christ is really present in the Eucharist and that we worship together. So uh, I hope you're right. I sincerely do that people sense that and they want to come back. Mm. 
So um, last uh, question, um, you know, let's say somebody's watching right now. Um, they're not religious. Uh, maybe they're agnostic or maybe even atheist. And they're in, but what you're saying is resonating. They're noticing that they feel, um, they just don't feel whole or like the way I felt, like I was always needing something. Something was always missing. What's the first step? They're not ready to, 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 to worship God. They're not ready to, to take that step. What's, what would be the first step for them to take to see if this actually improves their quality of life or brings them any value? Perform the simplest act of love. Love means willing the good of the other, right? So it doesn't mean a feeling. You can't just generate feelings about things. But you can do an act of the will. I will the good of another. I do something on behalf of somebody else. It could be helping a kid with their homework. It could be making cookies for someone. It could be a friendly smile, right, to someone who looks lonely. Perform the simplest act of love. And you actually have opened a very important door thereby because at the heart of Christian faith is the claim that God is love, right? He doesn't just have love. He is love. That's what God's nature is. So when we love authentically, even in the simplest way, you are in fact in the presence of God. You, you are in fact filled up with the Holy Spirit, to, at least to a, to a degree, right? So I, I would, I, this was a famous thing in the 19th century. Uh, Jared Manley Hopkins, the great Catholic poet, right, was asked by an agnostic friend, I mean, what, what's the, what should I do? I, I want to believe in God, but I just can't muster it, you know? And Hopkins said to him, give alms. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. In other words, perform a simple act of love. Give some of what you have to the poor. Find, find a homeless person and just go up to that person and give them something. Or smile. Greet them. Say something warm and friendly to them. That's a first step, but a very important step. Because Mother Teresa of Calcutta or the Little Flower that the highest saints will say, the culmination of the spiritual life is that, <laughs> is to perform the simplest act of love. If I go to Mass every day and I read spiritual books and I'm studying Thomas Aquinas, but I have not love, as St. Paul said, I'm nothing, <laughs> right? I'm nothing. So, so do that. Right now, today, perform an act of love. And you've opened the most important door into the spiritual life. That's a great way to end this uh, interview, Bishop. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate hey, it. Hey, Sal, always my pleasure. Great talking to you. Thank you.